Now, for me, when it comes down to being called to preach and then doing that, that no matter what else I have to do in the ministry, that may be work, but preaching is like cherry on top of the Sunday. You know what I mean? That's the fun part for me. It's just proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. I love it. And it's always exciting for me to preach to people that like to listen. You can tell when people when tuned in, and you can tell when they're not. Now, one of the things that I try to do is I try to bring messages that will get people closer to God and also be very practical to help people to understand some simple truths in the Word of God. To me, this book is so clear. This is God's revelation to mankind. If God wanted to keep us in the dark about things, all he had to do was say nothing. When God wrote what he wrote, He wrote it for us to understand it. And he didn't just write it for the theologians. As a matter of fact, I think most of the theologians don't get it. I mean, he wrote it for just the average Christian, any Christian. They don't have to have a high school diploma even. God wrote it for you. If you're saved, God wrote it for you. God wants you to understand and know his word. And after all, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit of God living within you. And he's the author of the book. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He wants to teach you. That's his job, according to John, chapter 14 through chapter 16. He wants to teach you his word and his will. I think about Ecclesiastes chapter 12 where he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Boy, that simplifies it, doesn't it? It's really not that hard. You say, well, preacher, what about the parts that are really hard to understand? There'll be a time for you to know that. But in the meantime, remember this, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. The emphasis in the scripture for God's people is simple. Obey God. Fear God and obey God. And if you'll do that, you're going to be just fine. I'd like you to turn to start out. We're going to look at a number of scriptures again tonight. But turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. There's some things that we automatically know from the Bible. We know, for instance, that thanks to Adam and Eve, that... In our lifetime, there's going to be suffering. In our lifetime, there are going to be hard times. Now, if you're a millennial, I hate to shock you with that. And I I don't hope you won't run out and take a depression pill to try to get you through it. But you're going to have hard times in life. Now, don't get mad at God about that. Don't get mad at the preacher about it. Don't get mad at the church. And don't get mad at other Christians Just get mad at Adam and Eve and you can tell them off when you get to heaven. Amen? But there's going to be suffering. Hey, the one perfect man to walk on the planet suffered. As a matter of fact, he suffered like no other person on the planet. And he never did anything wrong. And yet somehow we think we're going to have it easy. But here's the sad part. The sad part is that we get a lot of suffering that it wasn't necessary for us to have. I mean, it, it wasn't necessary. It wouldn't have happened. It, they're just things that were totally unnecessary. And we're going to start out in a passage where something like that happens. So you turn to Genesis chapter 4, and let me begin with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. I pray the Spirit of God would fill me and direct my thoughts. And Father, capture our hearts tonight. Help us to realize some very clear truths. I'm reminded of Isaiah the prophet when he said, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Just let us reason together. Lord, if we could just stop and think we could undo a whole lot of suffering in our life. Have your way now tonight in every heart and life, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis chapter 4, beginning at verse 3, of course, Adam and Eve have already messed up. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God had taught them about the blood sacrifice that was necessary 
when he made coats for Adam and Eve in chapter 3. And we're here, here we are in chapter 4. It says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering... He had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. You think things have not changed over all these years. God can write very clearly what we're supposed to do, and then we put in our own ideas, and when God doesn't accept it, we get mad at him. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. Now here he is. God taught him about the blood sacrifice. Abel brings a blood sacrifice. Cain brings a sacrifice of the work of his hands. He had tilled the ground. So the Bible says Cain is very wroth. Now notice what takes place. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth. At the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, he lets him know, Cain, this can all be taken care of. Go back and bring the right sacrifice. Why are you angry? You don't have to be angry. You know what you're supposed to do. You know, it's amazing how many people get mad at the preacher preacher simply because he reminds them of what they're supposed to do. And everything would just be fine if they just decided to get their lives in line with God's Word and do what they're supposed to do. But it's easier to get mad at the preacher. And then they compound the problem by making unwise decisions. Well, I'm going to go someplace where I'm going to preach that where I can do what I want to do. All right, Cain, go ahead. Go ahead. So Cain, he's mad. He's not going to bring the right sacrifice. It says in verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou curt, notice this, and now... Art thou cursed from the earth, which had opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand? When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee your strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Well, whose fault's that? That wasn't God's fault. It didn't have to be this way. Everything would have been fine. All they had to do was go back, get a right sacrifice, bring it out. Abel would be alive. Cain wouldn't be cursed in the land. Cain would be doing fine. Everything would be wonderful. The entire family would still be able to be together. But no, he's decided he wants his way. He's going to do it his way. He's going to have his way. And now he doesn't have what he wanted. You know, a lot of people, it's like shooting yourself in the foot. Why would you do that? Well, I'll show them I'll shoot myself. And now that shows them is how stupid you are. That's what happened here in Cain. Matter of fact, go over to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel, Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33. Of course, David back in chapter 11 committed his immorality with Uriah's wife. Bathsheba, has Uriah murdered? And then, of course, the prophet in the next chapter reveals the sin of of David to himself and lets him know of all the things that he's going to suffer. And we find just a tremendous amount of turmoil in the family of David. Amnon, his one son, rapes Tamar, his daughter. Absalom, another son, murders Amnon. Am- Absalom then runs David off the throne. Battle takes place between David's forces and, and Absalom's forces, and Absalom is killed in the battle. 
When David gets word of what took place, he's not rejoicing that his forces won, but instead he is mourning about his son. And notice in chapter 18 and verse 33, the scripture says, And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate, and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son My son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. And you know, all I can think of every time I read that verse is, David, you didn't have to die for that boy to be alive. All you had to do, son, was just keep Bathsheba out of your bedroom and Amnon would be alive, Tamar would be undefiled, Absalom would be alive, and later uh, Adonijah would be alive. All you had to do was at a time when kings went forth to battle and you tarried in the palace, once you saw her, you should have recognized that's not where you were supposed to be. You should have went out, got in your chariot, headed to the battle, but instead you brought her into your bedroom. David, it didn't have to be like this. And there's one person to blame, David. Listen to me. There are a lot of Christian homes that are in turmoil because late at night when dad's supposed to be asleep, he's in on the computer going to sites he has no business going to, seeing things he has no business seeing, And then the fruit of that is a broken marriage and a broken home and children. I'm talking about Christian homes that should have known better as soon as they saw some of the things they saw. This can only turn out bad. Turn it off. Get out of there. But they don't do it. Their lives end up in turmoil. Oh, the preachers that have lost ministries, the deacons that have been shamed, and their disgrace in their towns, the families that have been wrecked, all because they went someplace they shouldn't have gone. It was totally unnecessary. It didn't have to be like that. We'll turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 28. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, there are so many stories like this throughout your Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, beginning in verse 16, you've got... King Saul, it says, and he goes to a witch of Endor. Now, the reason King Saul's in the problem that he's in is because he's not been the king he was supposed to be. Back when he disobeyed God in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and not destroying all the Amalekites and destroying all they had, when Samuel comes in to rebuke him, Saul first lies about everything. He says, I've obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And God had just said, he didn't obey the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel keeps it right, keeps him right on the spot. And he says, hey, Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, then God exalted you to be king. The problem is you think you're king in your own eyes now. That's your problem. He said, but we brought these things back to sacrifice. And Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and hearken than the fat of rams. From that point on, his whole demeanor gets worse. His kingliness gets worse on down through. Now by the time you get to 1 Samuel chapter 28, he's facing a battle that's coming up against the Philistines. And he pretty much knows he's going to get whooped. But he's been talking, trying to talk to God and God wouldn't answer back. So he runs to the witch of Endor. And, And he gets a surprise visit from Samuel. And Samuel tells him what's going to take place. Notice in verse 15 it says, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me? seeing the Lord is departed from thee and has become thine enemy. 
and the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Now Samuel's got more to say to him. But now he's got the word that he's going to die. The battle's coming up and he's going down. He's going to die. And Samuel basically is letting him know, Samuel, it didn't have to be like this. You're in the mess you're in, Samuel. You're the one who made the mess. And that's why you're in the trouble. You know, it's one thing to go through a life where there's going to be trouble just because there's sin and death, just because of sin as it is. But why on earth do we keep doing things to just bring upon ourselves a whole lot more trouble that we didn't have to have if we would have only done right? I think one of the strongest men in all the Bible, his name is Samson. Turn back to the book of Judges, chapter 16. In Judges, chapter 16, Samson, of course, was a Nazarite from birth. That meant he was supposed to be dedicated to God. As a Nazarite, he was not to cut his hair to show his submission to God. He was not to touch anything in a vineyard or even be in the vineyard or drink anything from the vineyard. He was not to touch any dead body. He was to be separated unto God. But throughout the story of Samson, he continued to violate the very things that a Nazarite was not supposed to do. He had violated them all except for the cutting of his hair, which was a sign of his pledge to God. Well, we find him with Bathsheba, I'm sorry, with, uh, yeah, David and Beth, not David. He find him with... Uh, Delilah, there you go. I knew, uh, well, anyway. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole story. This incident, to show you how sin dumbs you down, this entire story shows the deceitfulness of sin. I mean, how many times do you have to wake up with the one that you're trusting that says she loves you, and she's saying, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Each time he told her something. That's what was done. He never got it. The Bible says, Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And there's nobody that gets beat. I don't care how smart you think you are or how good of a liar you think you may be. Buddy, sin deceives you. And you get caught, if you, even if you're doing something as simple as giving $500,000 to get your child into a special college. Verses 20 and 21. And she said, his hair's cut now. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Now, I want you to notice that statement. Surely, if his hair had never been cut all of his life, He has served as a judge for 20 years, so we know that he's at least in his 40s. He's got a head of hair. That has to be heavy. He has to know that his hair's not there. But he wished not that the Lord had departed from him. You know, he had gotten to the place where he doubted that that great strength came from God. He thought it was him. He thought he he could handle these Philistines again. But now wait, look what takes place. But the Philistines took him. Look at it. Look at the gruesomeness of it. And put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. Now we look at this big strong man. We can recount some of the tremendous feats that he did of strength. But he played with God once too often. You know, God, although he would pay for it down the line, and he paid for some things 
in his life, like losing the one gal he was sweet on that ended up being burned and so on. This was the strongest guy in Israel, and he never seemed to have success. He always was wanting something else, never could quite reach it. And now here he is, very close to the end of his life. His eyes are gouged out. They didn't just hurt the retinas. They gouged his eyes out. There are empty sockets right there. He can't see light. He can't see darkness. He has to be led wherever he goes. And throughout the day, at the mills of the enemy of God, he, he grinds like a blind donkey. And he just walks in a continuous circle ma- making food for his enemies. Now you look at that big, strong man. Doesn't look so strong now, does he? Doesn't look like a big, tough guy now, does he? As a matter of fact, the Philistines are going to get together and have a party and they're going to bring out Samson so they can laugh at him. Laugh at him and laugh at Samson's God. And I look at Samson. Of course, the sad thing is, throughout Samson's life, you never see him make one spiritual statement. Everything was about him. Boy, there's your original millennial. Everything was about him. Now we see him, eyes gouged out. He can't see. And he's just walking around in circles in that mill of the Philistines. And you say, Samson, it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be that way. God wanted you to be a champion for God's people. But here you are. Do you notice that in all the exploits of Samson, not one time did anybody else from Israel ever come to help him? Other judges could call up armies out of Israel. Samson couldn't. Even his own people wouldn't help him. And it didn't have to be that way. It ended up that way because of his own wicked decisions. Let me give you another one. This is all introduction. It's a long introduction and then a not quite as long message. All right. So go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Familiar story. Notice, told by the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in verse 19. And let me say at the beginning, the story of the rich man and Lazarus is not a parable. It's important that you get that. You say, preacher, how do you know that? I know it because, number one, Jesus does not call it a parable. He had a lot of stories that he called parables. He doesn't call this one a parable. In all the stories that Jesus called a parable, he never put a name on any of the characters in the story. In this story that Jesus tells, he gives us the name of the beggar. And the beggar is a man by the name of Lazarus. This is not the Lazarus that Jesus rose from the dead in John chapter 11. This is a different Nazareth. But let me just say, even if it was a parable, which it's not, but even if it was, the purpose of a parable was to explain and bring light upon spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth of this is, if you die without Jesus Christ, you go to a burning hell, and you burn forever. So even if it were a parable, that offers absolutely no comfort for those outside of Jesus. But now notice verse 19. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. For some people who want to tell you that hell in the New Testament is simply the grave, just read this story. That's absolute nonsense. This man, this rich man, died and was buried, 
and in hell, he lift up his eyes. He could see where he was at. And he wasn't laying there peacefully in a grave. He's in a place where he is in torment. And he's, notice it says, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, see of Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Now we've got two men that no doubt were Jews. One was a rich man, one was a beggar. The beggar in his life evidently found time to turn to God because Lazarus, when he died, went to heaven. He went to paradise, to Abraham's bosom. The rich man, who no doubt knew all the trappings of Judaism, No doubt, he must have been well known in the society and he wasn't known for being a publican, a publican that would have been hated by the Jews. And yet, he was so busy building all of his barns and building the nice house and having the fine clothes that he never took the time to get saved. Jesus told Nicodemus, a Pharisee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, yes, I feel for him in hell, burning forever. But it didn't have to be that way. Nobody has to die and go to hell. Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's why he put his son Jesus on the cross of Calvary to pay our sin debt, to die in our place, and then be buried and raised three days later from the dead. The Bible says in Romans 4, 25, that he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. God did a complete work in getting our sins taken care of. And all that rich man had to do was come to Jesus. I mean, he's an adult. We don't know how old he is, old enough to have some riches in his own home and to be well known to where here's a beggar who thought maybe he might get some crumbs from that guy that would fall from his table. And now we see him in hell and in torment and nobody can get to him to make it any better for him. Lazarus will not be able to put a drop of water on his tongue. Nothing. But it didn't have to be that way. That was his choice. Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Wouldn't it be sad if somebody left this service, Mount Zion Baptist Church in Brogue, Pennsylvania, left this service without Jesus Christ, get about a mile down the road, and some drunk comes too far around on the curve and hits them, and they go out into eternity without Christ. They would be burning in hell when they would open up their eyes in hell, burning in torment, no escape, and it didn't have to be that way. They could have taken Christ tonight at Mount Zion Baptist Church. Think of the multitudes in hell. The multitudes burning, and none of them had to go there. God provided an escape. And they didn't take it. That's not God's fault that they didn't take it. It's not God's fault that this man ended up in hell. It's his fault. And everybody who dies without Jesus, that's where they're going to spend eternity. Now, I know we live in a soap opera world. Women and men living in their own trials and troubles. And without exception, every one of us have had some trials that are simply our own fault. They might have come from things we said that if we'd have stopped and thought for just a minute. But once we said those things we said, you can't call them back. They're out there. Or done some things that they... Listen, I I used to have, before I got saved, and probably even shortly after I got saved, I used to have quite a temper. 
That's a temper. I never, I, I wasn't a fighter. I, I, didn't, I didn't try to get into fights. That wasn't my thing. But, uh, man, I'd get mad. And when I got mad, the first thing I had in my hand, I threw it. I would throw it somewhere. Now, anybody here ever have trouble with temper? Anybody here? You know, yeah, something about that temper thing. You know, it's, uh, it's like the one lady said to, to Billy Sunday. She said, listen, I, I, have, I, I have a temper. Now, it only lasts for a minute or two and it's over. And he said, yeah, man, but it's like a shotgun blast. It blows everything apart that's right in front of it. May only take a second. I remember after I got saved, I mean, God did an awful lot to heal my temper. But there was one night. I was pastoring Tennessee Ridge Baptist Church, and we had a man in the church who had three teenagers. Now, if you still got your temper and you got teenagers, you'll probably find your temper again. You understand what I'm saying? Well, this guy had been divorced for a number of years, and these three teens, they were rather rebellious in nature. It was about 10 o'clock at night, and he called me up, and he said, Brother Allison, can you come over to our house? My children are giving me a hard time. I need help. I said, okay, I'll be there. And I went over to his house. And uh, at that time, I had, a, I had a gremlin that I drove. And I pulled it. Oh, some of you, weren't those the ugliest cars in the world? You know, that was an engineer that should have been shot, whoever came up with that thing. But I had a gremlin that I drove, and I pulled into his driveway. Well, his driveway kind of went down. The higher part of the hill was up here. Here was the road, and then his house was down here. And so my car was parked at an angle like that, and I go inside. And the three youngins, the two boys and the girl, they're, they're sitting on the couch. And I said, okay, Howard, what's the problem? And he began to tell me what the problem was, and I made the mistake. I made the mistake of looking over while he's telling me about how they've been acting, what they've been doing, how rebellious they've been. I made the mistake of looking over at them. And these, these three teenagers were sitting there. I'm going to tell you, if there's anything I can't stand, it is a disrespectful little snot-nosed brat of a teenager who knows nothing about life at all. They've been fed, they've been bathed, they've been taken care of, and they think they know better than their parents. And I looked over there, and I saw them doing this stuff, and buddy, it, the Hulk. I mean, suddenly, everything went red, tunnel vision went in, and I turned around and I got in the face of the oldest one and boy, I let him have it. And then I went to the next one and I got down in her face and I let her have it. And I went to the younger one and I went to him, put my finger in his nose, not in his nose, on his nose. <laughs> and I let him have it. And then I turned around and I yelled at their dad. Man, I was hot. And then I stormed out the door. I am angry. By this time, it's about 11 o'clock at night. It's dark. I reached in my pocket and I got my keys. And I threw them at the grill of my car. This isn't funny. The problem was I didn't hit the grill of my car. I hit my windshield. The windshield was slanted. And when my keys hit that windshield, they went flying over the road in the dark into an empty field with tall grass. Everything just drained out of me. Now what do I do? I can't even get in my car. I hadn't unlocked it yet. I don't have a spare key. This was before cell phones. I couldn't call my wife and say, come get me. So I walk up the hill just in the hopes that maybe they stopped before they got to the field. They hadn't. Only one thing to do. I went back and I knocked on their door. 
The oldest boy comes to the door and says, Preacher? I said, You got a flashlight? He said, well, Yeah, we got a flashlight. I said, Get it. He said, What's the problem? I said, Lost my keys. Well, preacher, where do you think you lost them? Over there. <laughs> it was only for a minute. I've never done that since. That took care of it right there. And the embarrassment, boy, did I look foolish. Matter of fact, I feel pretty foolish just telling the story. But the reality is we do a lot of things in the heat of different moments that create problems that last far longer than that little story that I told you. And it damages many. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end over the ways of death. The Bible says in James that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Why don't people get smart? Why don't they wise up? Why don't they understand that, hey, life is short and you're going to have problems. There's going to be sickness. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be problems with other people. Why make any more than what you're going to have just by being alive? Why would you add to it? And yet people do it all the time. There are four divine principles. Maybe I might give you five about this matter. Let me tell you, you young people, if you'll listen up tonight, I can save you a world of heartache in your life tonight. A world of heartache. If you can get this nailed down, understand this. These are Bible truths that are not going to change. First of all, there's the principle of sowing and reaping. Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth of the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth of the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. You see, we see it in nature. It's so clear in nature. We know that if you go out into your field and you plant corn, that when it comes time to do some reaping, you're not going to reap wheat. Again, it doesn't take a rocket science or a Huntsville engineer to understand that. You're going to reap what you sow. And here's the thing. You're going to reap more than what you sow. And you're going to reap longer than what you sow. Man, you you want to have a a good married life one day? And some of you young ladies, you you want to have a, a good family and a husband you can trust and all that? Well, then do everything right. But I guarantee you, you start doing wrong in your relationships and it's going to bring about reaping in your marriage and in your home life. Reaping that never should have happened if you'd have just done right. Man, listen to your preacher. Listen to your mom and dad. Get a hold of this. Save yourself a world of heartache by doing right. Hosea 8, 7 says, For they have sown the wind. And they shall reap the whirlwind. You know, I look at people like Ahab and Jezebel. You say, man, that's a king and queen. They had everything going for them. Yeah, and Ahab dies in a battle when an archer who wasn't even aiming at him shot him and killed him. And Jezebel ends up getting eaten by the dogs at the wall of Jezreel where her everything but her hands and her feet and her filthy mind, the dogs wouldn't touch. That's how she ended up. Didn't have to be that way. Didn't have to be that way. But you see, they decided that they were going to go their way. They were going to do their religion their way. God doesn't like it. That's tough. Well, they, they found out since then that the tough wasn't on him. It's on God. It's on them. They're the ones who messed up. The stupidity of sowing the wrong things. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Nobody beats God. Nobody beats God. 
And understand, when you stand there shaking your fist at God because you don't like his rules, you don't like what he tells you you're not supposed to do, and stuff, the Bible says in Psalm 2, he sits in the heavens and laughs. Who do you think you are? Nobody's ever beaten him. He's God. And it isn't like he didn't warn you in his word. Every time I read through the book of Judges, I'm thinking, what's wrong with you people? You're going through so much heartache you don't have to go through. If you'd have just done what Joshua said to do in Joshua 24, the book of Judges would have been a book of victory. You reap what you sow. Number two, there's the law of disobedience. Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 11 tried to teach his people early on about this. And this was plain for God's people. Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in verse 26. And the scripture says, Behold, I set before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye will obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse, if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. Now God says, hey, I've got something for you. In one hand, I've got a blessing. In the other hand, I've got a curse. And then he shows us the hands. You don't have to be super smart to get this one. You don't have to be a lucky guesser. He said, I got a blessing for you. And he goes on to tell about the different blessings that they would have if they simply obeyed his word. To get this blessing, you've got to obey his word. And he says, but I've also got a curse for you. Get your choice. You can have either one. He's not going to make you choose right. That's up to you. And we really show how smart or ignorant we are by how we choose. He says, you choose the curse. You choose not to obey my commandments. This is what you get. You choose to obey my commandments. These are the blessings you get. You say, I want the blessings, but I want to do my own thing. You don't get to make the rules. So wise up. Again, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every evil work or every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Well, I don't know that I like the choices. It's all you got. God's not going to change his mind. He's written his word real clear. What do you want in your life? If you live, let's say, to 50 years of age, don't you want a good life that counts for something? Don't you in those 50 years want the blessings of God in your life? If you live to 70, don't you want it to be a good life? I mean, hey, if it's just a long life with misery, what on earth have you gained? God says, here's how you get my blessings. Obey my word. By the way, in the New Testament, I know some people are thinking, well, preacher, you're just quoting Old Testament verses. Well, in one of the last books written in the New Testament, he defines sins for us. He says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Listen, with sin comes judgment. So what do you want? This matter of the law of disobedience. God wants, he demands obedience. Blessings for obeying, cursings for disobeying. So obey. Now it's clear. And you can see examples of that through scripture. Israel was told when they got, before they got into the promised land that the very first city that they won against, they were to take all the spoil of the city and they were to take it out and burn it as a sacrifice to God. They weren't to keep any of it. They were not to touch what he called the accursed thing. They were not to keep it. They'd get spoil out of Ai. They'd get spoil out of all the other cities they would take. But the first city, all the spoil belonged to God. And here's Achan. He's with the army. He goes out to do battle. He goes into one house and he sees in one house of the enemy, he sees some silver and some gold and a goodly Babylonian garment. 
Now he knows that's supposed to go to God. But he takes it, hides it, takes the gold, takes the silver, gets back to his tent. He hides it in the tent. Now get this lesson, folks. This is important. Nobody else saw it. The only one who knew besides Achan was God. And God knows everything you do. When God writes his seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to every church, he says, I know thy works. He knows you. He knows everything you do. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and hast laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Well, since you can't hide from God, God knows everything. You can make it real easy on yourself. Just do right. But you see, he doesn't do right. He hides that stuff. The next day, Israel goes out to fight against Ai, and they get beat. 36 Israelites die. Joshua comes back, and he's upset with the Lord. It wasn't God's fault. Israel had sinned. And when you're in sin, the victories aren't there. When you're in sin, it's going to be bad. God said, tomorrow, I'll let you know who it is. And the next day, they brought him up by family. And God revealed that Achan was the reason. Joshua asked him what he did. He told them what he took. And then God gave the command, take Achan, his wife, his children, his animals, everything he has. Take him out to the valley, and all of Israel is to stone him with stones. I wonder... If Achan would have realized when he went into that house that that Babylonian garment and that gold is what he was selling his family for. That's what he did. It was pure disobedience. Men, you want God to have his blessings on your home? Obey him. Obey him. Now, if you don't obey him, if you're saved, you're still going to heaven. But then you're going to reap what you sow, and there's the law of disobedience that takes place. I look at Uzzah. You know, there's one guy in the Bible I feel sorry for, and that's Uzzah. Uzzah in the Bible, you remember, David was wanting to take the ark of God up to the city of David. And everybody's excited. Everybody's out about this. They're having a big parade. They're singing their praises. David's jumping around. Man, they're having a great old meeting. But they're not doing it like God said. God said that the furniture of the tabernacle was to be carried on the priest's shoulders. And they weren't to touch it. They were to run staves through the rings in each of those things. But instead, they had it on a cart. And here's Uzzah with Ohio. They are, they are the ones that are chosen to drive the oxen and to keep the cart, man. Everything's going on all around them. And one of the oxen stumble. The ark begins to wobble. And I believe that that poor man did the same thing that I would have done. He reached up to steady it so it wouldn't fall in the dust and God killed him. Because God told Israel in the book of Numbers that if anybody touched that furniture of the ark, they would die. And God always keeps his word. Are you saying, preacher, that it would have been better off if Uzzah had let it fall? You're always better off to obey God. Yes. Yes. And it would have taught David a severe lesson. One of the things that bothers me about that passage is that it says, and David was displeased. Well, man, I'll be more than that. This man's dead that's following you, David, and he's dead because you guys are doing this all wrong. I'm just simply saying there's the law of disobedience. Then also there's the law of chastening. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son Every son whom he receiveth. 
If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons, or illegitimate and not sons. If you're a child of God and you can do, if you say you're a child of God and you can do wrong and you don't get chastened, you don't belong to him. Because he chastens every one of his children and he says this about that in verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now I had got take, taken out to the shed a few times by my daddy. And you know what that taught me? That if I was good, I wouldn't get taken out to the shed. I mean, I may not have been the, the brightest bulb in the pack, but I was bright enough to understand that if I did right, I didn't get a spanking, and I didn't want any more of those spankings. He'd take off that belt, bring that down around, well, the place where you're supposed to do spankings, and uh, man, it was rough. So I didn't get many spankings because I was a quick learner. I got news for you. Every time I do wrong, I have a heavenly father that chastens me as well. And I just think it's better off to do right and avoid the chastening. It's just smart, isn't it? I mean, doesn't that just make sense? I wonder about some people. I've got a, I've got a grandson, bless his heart who hasn't seemed to learn the lesson yet. But he's got a daddy who's going to keep teaching the lesson till he passes. Amen. Then there's the law of love. You say, what's the law of love? Let me show you. Turn over and we're going to end up soon here. Turn over to the book of John chapter 14. The law of love as taught by Jesus Christ. I may have referred to this the other day, but it bears repeating again. Jesus is speaking in verse 21. And he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now that's pretty, pretty plain. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And you look at verse 24. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. Now, I've seen those, I, I, I've, I've seen films of people at these different singings and some of these preaching meetings where a person will stand up there at the, at the front and he'll say, clap if you love Jesus, and people clap. That's not what Jesus says. He says, if you love me, you obey me. And he says, if you don't obey me, it's because you don't love me. There's no middle ground on this. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5. Powerful verses. As a matter of fact, verse 3 of this chapter in 1 John chapter 5 is a verse that I have a message on that I says the verse in the Bible that doesn't seem to be true. But notice verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Now, verse 3 is what I want you to really get. He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Now, here's the part where a lot of people live like it's not true. And his commandments are not grievous. Do you know there's teachings going on in churches today that somehow their false view of grace means that if you feel like you've got to obey any of God's commands, that you're really in bondage? Which is interesting to me because there wasn't a command of Jesus that, that, a command of God that Jesus ever disobeyed, and he wasn't in bondage. Matter of fact, I walk at liberty because I keep thy precepts. That's what the psalmist said. There's freedom in his, in his words, in his commands. Now, we don't keep the commands in order to go to heaven, but I'm saved. I belong to God. I want to please Him. I keep His man commands because I am going to heaven. Now, if you're trying to keep them in order to get to heaven, you're lost. You trust Jesus to go to heaven. Amen? But it is the law of love. There are a lot of lying hypocrites out there. They say they love God while they walk in disobedience. Judas knew Him. Judas kissed Him. But Judas missed the law of love. He was a hypocrite. He was a hypocrite. 
You know, a lot of people, although they may be born again, they live like atheists. They live like God's not really alive. They live like he doesn't really mean what he said. They think somehow that they can walk contrary to God's word with impunity and then tell people that they love Jesus. Well, no, they don't. If you love him, you will obey him. One last thing and we're done. There's the law of life. The law of life. In 1 John chapter 5, again, look on down, verse 11. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, did you get that? He that hath the Son hath what? He that hath not the Son of God hath not what? What makes the difference as to whether or not you have life? Whether or not you got the Son. Do you have the Son? If you have the Son, you have life. you don't have the Son, you don't have life. If you have religion, no, nah, that's not life and religion. He says, this is the record that, in verse 11 again, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Let's just pretend for a second that this piece of paper here is, oh, this piece of paper is eternal life. And this book right here is Jesus the Son. God says that I have put eternal life in my son. Now, he wants you to have eternal life. He says, now to have it, though, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You say, I want eternal life. Well, then what do you have to take? His son. Because eternal life is in his son. If you have the son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you might have being baptized, you might have religion, you might have church membership, you might have a moral life, but if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. In John chapter 5, Jesus said to the Jews that were arguing with him again, he said, search the Scripture, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I've heard some foolish statements made by Baptist preachers that really trouble me. You understand, this book is not Jesus. This is God's written word. Jesus is God's living word. The written word points us to the living word. You can have a Bible and die and go to hell. But if you take Jesus, who the Bible points you to... Then you're going to heaven. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Here's the law of life. You take a look at that rich man who was rich. He died, was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Why? His loss didn't have to be. If he had just followed the law of life, if he would have just had Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, you understand the difference between the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. The Old Testament saints, they didn't get life by the blood of bulls and goats. They had to put their trust in the Messiah that was coming. And in the New Testament times, we look at the Messiah who came. Our trust is in him. Even Abraham got saved the same way we did. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, after he received the promise of the Son. The Bible says, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Paul quotes that very verse three times in the New Testament. When he believed the promise of the Son, that's when he was declared righteous before God. In the Son is Jesus Christ. So the law of life is simply this. You have Christ, you have life. You don't have Christ, you don't have life. Do you have Christ? Have you trusted him alone to save you? Nothing else, no one else. Put all your faith and trust. Realize we're sinners before God. We deserve the judgment of God. We covered that in some detail last night. How we deserve the judgment of God. And God, because he paid our sin debt at Calvary through the blood of his son, you take his son as your savior and you get eternal life, which is in him. Now, everything that I've shared with you tonight, 
As I said, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. It's clearly taught. All these things clearly taught in the Word of God. Now, we know you're gonna, there's going to be troubles in life. Everybody's going to have some troubles. and They'll be different for each person. But there's a whole lot of troubles you don't have to go through if you understand sowing and reaping. By the way, on that sowing and reaping, it works both ways. In other words, you sow wrong, you reap wrong. But if you sow right, you reap right. Now, duh, if I want to reap right, I'm just going to do right. I like it. That's what I've tried to teach my children. That's what I've tried to teach my grandchildren. Life doesn't have to be as hard as a whole lot of people make it. Now, I was brought up, as you know, in a home of drinking and cursing. The only time I heard the name Jesus growing up was as a curse word. I got saved. I got burdened from my family. Thank the Lord. After being saved about four years, I was finally able to win my mom to Christ. I was able to lead a brother to Christ. I was able to lead a sister to Christ. Thank the Lord for that. I tried to witness to my dad a number of times. My dad would not take Christ as his Savior. My dad died of a massive heart attack early on a Sunday morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, after a night of drunkenness. The Bible says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. I have no doubt that as I preach tonight in Brogue, Pennsylvania, that my father burns in hell. It didn't have to be that way. God wanted my dad saved more than I wanted my dad saved. He put his son on the cross for my dad. I had, thank God, I had a few opportunities to witness to him, and I did. But he would just be a tough guy. And I saw him only broken one time. The one time I saw him broken, he and his wife, a stepmother of mine, not my mom, he and his wife had been in a car accident. And I went up to see him. And I went again through trying to tell him about Christ. And he had tears in his eyes. Of course, he was holding them back the best he could. And I asked him, Dad, wouldn't you like to take Christ as Savior? No. No. God doesn't make anybody get saved. God won't make you here tonight get saved. He, he, he's not pleased with just some robot coming to take him. It's got to be of your own free will. But if you die without Jesus, you go to hell. And it won't be anybody's fault but your own. So if you're lost tonight, come to Jesus. Accept the law of life. There's life in Christ. But outside of Christ, there's death and hell. So get saved. In the law of sowing and reaping or the law of disobedience or the law of, of, uh, 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 of the other things that I talked about tonight. Young people, listen up tonight. One day you're going to get married. Right now, right now, you're setting the stage for some of the things that will be in your marriage. If you'll do right, you'll be able to reap right. You want life life to be good, as good as it can be for you? Then it has to do with you taking God seriously, making the right decisions, making the right choices. Young men, do the same thing. God's got promises for you. So walk in obedience to him. You got things in your house that you shouldn't have? Get rid of them. Get rid of them. You say, but but I, I don't know. You know, I, I really like that. But you're going to reap. You're not going to like the reaping. And you're not going to like the chastening. So if you don't want to go through those things, get get those things out of your life. And then you won't have to reap wrong. And then you won't have to do the chastening. And then you won't have the curses. See, things can be... Don't make it harder than it is. I don't know why we all just can't be happy. I'll tell you why. We won't make the right decisions. And it's nobody's fault but our own. 